Morning. I uh, want to remind you that the uh, labs begin this week. I want to remind you that the labs begin this week, uh, so that uh, and your discussion sections also. So please make sure you make them. If you are absent from the first session, uh, I think you'll be dropped from the class. So make sure that you go, even if you're planning on changing or trying to change section, because that's the only way we have a recording that you're actually in the class by showing up at the first lab and discussion section. Now, last time uh, I started to talk to you about the origin of plants, the green plants, and uh, we spent most of the time talking about the algae. And we said that the algae, and we talked particularly about the green algae, invented a very unusual life cycle, and the life cycle depended upon two different plants. which were produced successively in a cycle. And the life cycle could not be complete if only one of the plants was produced. And we gave a name to those two plants. One was called the sporophyte, which we said was 2N. And the other one was the gametophyte, which was N. And that these two alternated in the life cycle to give the life cycle known as alternation of generations. Now, what is the relationship of these two organisms to each other? You're going to have an opportunity to see this in the lab, but in some cases, the sporophyte was bigger than the gametophyte in the ocean. In some cases, the gametophyte was bigger than the sporophyte. And in some cases, they were both the same size. And in the lab, you're going to have an opportunity to view these two different sizes of the plants. Make sure that you appreciate that the life cycle that we're going to be talking about for the rest of the class began with the green algae and began with their inventing alternation generations. Very important point, which once you understand it, is going to carry up through all the rest of the plants that we talk about in today's class. And in fact, through the end of the semester. Now, while the algae were inventing the alternation generation scheme, and we think as I mentioned before, that this happened several times. Other things were going on. So let's put the eukarya branch that we put last time on the board. And just for our discussion, we'll put animals up here at the top. And at this point, we'll say this is the origin of the algae. Now, during the first billion years, the algae were inventing or trying various life cycles. And uh, as I said, during this period of time, they reinvented a number of times the alternations of generation scheme. But something else was going on during these first billion years. Some of the algae from the ocean began to move from the ocean to lakes and bogs. So we also had movement to lakes and to bogs during this, million, this billion years. And there are, of course, other changes happening. About 490 million years ago, about 490 million years ago, after this first billion years of algal evolution, something remarkable happened. And that was that an alga left a lake or a bog and moved on to the land. It became, whatever it was, the first land plant. Now, in moving from a water environment in the lake or the bog onto the land, here we have an alga. This is a brown alga we talked about before, and it normally grows in the ocean. If we were to move on to the land, what would be some problems that we would encounter? Yes? How to, how to move around. Okay, how to move around. Okay, so. How to maintain your Okay, how to maintain your position. What else would we encounter? Yes? Pardon me? Water problems. What do you mean by water problems? Okay, water problems. So the water problems include support. What other kind of problems would you have related to water? Yes? How do you move water? Okay, transport. That's a good one. 
What else? How about drying out? So it could dry out. That's a water problem. And going back to the first answer of movement problems, what about the flagella? How are the gametes get together? Requires water for the movement. So fertilization which requires water. So all of these problems would be encountered by this alga or this first plant which moved on to the land. And these are problems which the plants had to deal with. Today we think that the plant which is living, which has the most characteristics of these first plants which moved on to the land, repre is represented by a group of plants which are still around today, which are known as the bryophytes. These plants, we believe, are the closest living relatives to what the first land plant, we think, looked like. The bryophytes are better known to you as the mosses, and the liverworts. And I'd like to spend a little time talking about the bryophytes. First of all, the bryophytes are not very significant with regard to the economy, except with one respect. One percent of the Earth's surface is covered with peat bogs. And peat is frequently, especially in poor countries, mined or cut off and used to heat homes. So. In this respect, the bryophytes are important. Now, let's spend a little bit of time looking at the bryophytes. We said that the problems that the plants moving on to the land would encounter are these problems over here. And we now have the bryophytes, which we said are close relatives, or close, we think, relatives as far as some of their characteristics to what the first land plants were like. So what do the bryophytes look like? How did they deal with this particular problem? Well, first of all, the bryophytes do not have a system for transporting water or nutrients. In the ocean, the algae is completely surrounded by water and nutrients, so there's no reason for it to develop a transport system. And the bryophytes have not developed a transport system. Like the algae, they have no way of moving liquid and nutrients great distances. And so, as a consequence, the bryophytes have remained small. And not only have they remained small, but if you come up here and look at the pots of bryophytes that we have, and I'll also show you some pictures of them, you will find that they are flat against the earth. They are pressed to the earth. In that way, they can absorb water and nutrients directly from the soil directly beneath them and not have to worry about transporting the water great distances. So the bryophytes have remained small, means they don't have to worry about a transport system. Because they're small, they don't have to worry about support because they're flat on the ground. And uh, now we want to consider these other two aspects, how the bryophytes have dealt with drying out, and fertilization. The bryophytes live in areas, if we look at them, and this is the reason we asked you co to collect them, that are periodically moist. Areas that are periodically moist. Given that they live in areas that are periodically moist, they have retained the flagellated sperm flagellated gametes. So you might say they live in these areas because they've retained flagellated gametes. This allows the gametes to get together when they're ready and when there's water available for fertilization to occur. Now let's talk a little bit about the bryophyte life cycle and some of these characteristics. This large bryophyte plant which I have here, and for those of you who come up or look at the slides later on, this moss plant, this is a liverwort in my left hand and a moss in my right hand. Both of these plants, which you see here, are the gametophyte. In the bryophytes, the gametophyte is dominant. It is the largest, 
and it is photosynthetic. So when the first land plants moved on to the land, they had a choice of taking the sporophyte and making it dominant or making it exactly the same size as the gametophyte. And the choice was made for the bryophytes to make the gametophyte dominant. We don't know what the selective pressures were that involved making that choice. Now let's look a little bit at the life cycle of the bryophytes and talk a bit about how some of these necessary adaptations figure into the life cycle. First of all, the bryophytes show alternation of generations. They have a gametophyte, which I just showed you, and a sporophyte to complete the life cycle. Just as you've seen before, nothing new. Now let's talk about an example of the life cycle of a bryophyte and put in some of these events which we have here on the board on the right and talk to you about some of these events which we have the plant having to deal with once it moves on to the land. And for this uh, dis discussion, I'm going to put on a moss, the life cycle of a moss. And uh, we'll have two different moss plants. So these are two different moss plants. They are green, and they're free living. So both of these two moss plants are the gametophyte generation. And for our discussion today, we're going to make a, a statement that one of the plants is female, that is, produces the female gamete, and one of the plants is male, that produces the male gamete. Now let's talk about how these plants, which grow in periodically moist areas, manage their life cycle. The male gamete has to get over to the female, or the female has to go get over to the male, but in this case, it's the male going to the female. We said that the gametes are flagellated, and yet these organisms grow on the land. How is it? that water is available to allow fertilization to occur? And the answer is, and should be obvious from the collections that many of you made today or over the weekend, is that water occasionally comes. For example, when it rains or when there's a periodic flooding, there's water available and the gametes therefore can get together. The problem is that the plant never knows when water is going to come. And so if it makes the gametes, the gametes risk drying out waiting for the water to come. And so what the plant has done, and this is the innovation that the bryophytes have done in moving on to the land, is they have made two structures to protect the gametes until water comes. And the structure which was made in the female is called the archegonium. It protects the egg. And the structure which was made in the male is called the antheridium. And it protects the sperm. So here we have these two plants, what we're calling a male and a female plant, with their gametes already made, waiting for water, whether it's rain or flooding or whatever, to occur to allow the gametes to get together. So let's make the female gametophyte. And she has an egg up here in the archegonium. And then uh, the gametes, we believe, can move from the male to the female in a number of ways through the water. The female may secrete a pheromone. No one is for sure about that. But the way the sperm swim toward the female we believe that there's an attractant. It's also possible that rainwater might splash the male gamete over to the female gametes. When this occurs, if we look inside, here is the archegonium. Here is the egg. 
And here is the male gamete. So at this point, we can get fertilization occurring when these two meet together. Let me uh, put it on this board up here. Put that up for you. Once fertilization occurs, and let's remind ourselves where it's occurring, here is the gametophyte. Here is where fertilization occurs here. If we wait for some time, what we find is something remarkable happening. And you can see this when you go outside and you look at the moss. Here is the gametophyte, which is green and photosynthetic. And out of the tip of the gametophyte, from the new embryo, from the new embryo, grows the new sporophyte. The new sporophyte. Through meiosis, it makes spores. And they grow into new gametophytes. So notice in the bryophytes that the gametophyte is independent, whereas the sporophyte is totally dependent on the gametophyte. So all of its food, all of its nutrition, all of its water, it gets from the gametophyte. It is never free living. And this is an important point. In the bryophytes, the gametophyte is free living. And in the sporophytes, are not free living. They are parasites, essentially, on that gametophyte. But they still show the alternations of generation life cycle. Very important for you to get this in your mind. We look at the bryophytes in the lab, and there are some examples up here in front if you have time after the lecture. Now, because the bryophytes needed water during some portion of their life cycle, and because they didn't have roots and a transport system, they basically remained confined, as I said, to areas which were periodically moist areas that were bogs and swamps. They couldn't really colonize a great deal of the Earth's surface. So the next evolutionary advance which comes along to move the plants into other areas of the Earth's surface involves the development of a transport system. or as it's referred to in your book, and as we will talk about it here, a vascular system. This vascular system consists of special cell types. We're going to talk about them a little later in the class, which are involved in the movement of water and nutrients. But for our discussion today, let's just talk about vascular system without identifying the cell type. We believe that this transport system develops somewhere between 387 and 408 million years ago to produce the vascular plants. Now, for our discussion today, I'd like to make a division of the vascular plants. That is, vascular plants with seeds and vascular plants without seeds. And I'd like to begin by talking about, first, vascular plants without seeds. That is, plants which have a transport system, which allows them to become big and to move, as we now know, into almost every environment on the Earth. These vascular plants now are about 250,000 species. And of these 250,000 species, about 12,000 are plants without seeds, vascular plants without seeds. The first group, then, we will consider are the seedless vascular plants. And perhaps the best example that's most familiar to most of you of a seedless vascular plant are the ferns. 
They have a transport system, but they don't produce seed. And I have up here in front a couple of examples of ferns, and you're going to see them in the lab. The distinguishing feature of the ferns for most of you is this large, often very showy, leathery leaf. This large, showy, leathery leaf is called a frond. When you look at a plant with fronds, and this is a remarkable puzzle, when you look at a fern plant with fronds, given that the ferns probably evolved from something which was a bryophyte, perhaps ancestor, maybe not, instead of this being the gametophyte, as it is in the bryophytes, this is the sporophyte. So in the ferns, fronds are part of the sporophyte. So when you look at a fern outside, all the ferns that you see growing, the ones that you might have around your home or in your dorm room, they are all sporophytes. This is a 2N generation. Now, if you turn the frond over, and there are various examples up here in front, and you look at the underside of a frond, you will see some of these have dots on them, like this one over here, dots on the underside of the frond. What are these dots? One student thought that it was a disease, and she kept on trying to clean them off. They're not a disease. These dots represent spores. So under the frond, spores are produced. And they're made inside of a protective structure called a sporangium. Called a sporangium. So if you look at the underside of these leaves, you have these protective structures, and this has to be done under the microscope. And inside these protective structures, spores are being made. So if this is the 2N generation, that is, this is the sporophyte generation, and the sporophyte is making spores, that means meiosis has to occur. This is an important point. Meiosis has to occur on the underside of these fronds. And because these leaves, these fronds, bear spores on them, they are called sporophylls. Where meiosis occurs, very important point. So, <clears throat> I've shown you now the diploid, the sporophyte generation, and I've told you that the sporophyte generation, as you might expect, makes spores. And this is a green plant which had as its ancestor a green alga. And like the bryophytes, it also inherited from the green algae the alternation of generations life cycle. So every fern which is growing outside, in order for it to complete its life cycle, has to make another plant, has to make a gametophyte. What do the gametophytes of ferns look like? Have any of you ever seen the gametophyte of a fern? Well, you can look at them in the lab, and I'm going to show you some slides of them. But I also have some gametophytes up here in front. They are small, green plants. They live independently and they undergo photosynthesis. So this plant here, in fact, there are many of these plants in this Petri dish, and this plant here alternate in the life cycle in order for the fern to complete its life cycle. And if you're careful and you go and you look under a fern, perhaps growing in an undisturbed wooded forest, you will be able to find small gametophytes growing at the base of that fern. Those small gametophytes came from the spores produced by the sporophyte which is usually much larger and growing above the gametophyte. So let's look at the life cycle now of a typical fern with these two plants, the sporophyte and the gametophyte. <clears throat> and let's begin with the sporophyte, this plant here which is made up of sporophylls and is making spores. So here we have the 2N 
sporophyte. The two end sporophyte. It makes spores, which I've just said are made on the underside of the leaf, through the process of meiosis. These spores are end because meiosis has occurred. Spores become gametophytes. Same thing that you saw before, going back to the algae. They become gametophytes, which are also N. Now, what does the fern gametophyte look like? I told you it was green. It was tiny, maybe a centimeter or less in size. And it undergoes photosynthesis. That is, it's free living. A typical gametophyte, although this is uh, stereotypical, is kind of heart-shaped, the gametophyte. This is N, remember? What does a gametophyte make? Gametophyte makes gametes. Where are the gametes made on this gametophyte? Well, if we look carefully on typical gametophytes, we'll find two areas where the gametes are made. We have the female gametes, and they're made in a structure which the bryophytes originated, in the archegonium. And we have the male gametes in the antheridium. Now, typically what happens, and a lot of people who are interested in population biology spend a lot of time studying gametophytes, typically what happens is the gametophyte first makes the female gamete or the egg. And it waits for a gamete from a male to come from another gametophyte someplace else so that it can outcross. But if it doesn't get fertilized after some period of time, it will make its own gametes, male gametes here, and self-fertilize. In that way, you have not lost the plant, although you have not created any new genetic material because you're fertilizing it essentially with your same DNA. So we have now an archegonium. And inside, let's uh, say this is the gametophyte here. Here's an archegonium. Here we have the new embryo. That is the new 2N sporophyte. And if you look carefully outside, and you're lucky, what you will see is you will find the gametophyte, but you will find apparently, it looks like it's growing on the gametophyte, you will find a new sporophyte growing out. This new sporophyte, which is growing out, is coming from the is coming from the archegonium, and it is now, for a period of time, until it becomes independent, living off of the gametophyte. It is essentially parasitizing the gametophyte. But in the ferns, the gametophytes and the sporophytes are independent. So this is an important point. They're both free-living, both photosynthetic, a very important point. Let's now look at some of the um, pictures of the bryophytes and of the fern gametophytes. Let's see if I can do this here. There we go. So here is a pot of moss. And what you see growing up from the moss is the sporophyte. It is green. But because it's uh, green, you shouldn't assume that it is independent. It still gets most of its food, as you can see from the next slide, from the haploid gametophyte, which is the main photosynthetic organism. These sporophytes are growing up from archegonia, which have been fertilized, and then the sporophyte grows up. Meiosis occurs here. Spores are produced to make more of these plants. The liverworts now, as I said, are flat, have no roots, are pressed to the surface of the soil, and they can directly absorb nutrients and not have to transport them over great distances. The liverworts, which you will see in lab, are quite complex in structure. 
And this dried specimen in the next slide will show you these complex structures. This is all gametophyte tissue. The only time you ever see the sporophyte is if you look under the arms of one of these gametophyte, looks like an umbrella, you will see little yellow structures. This is the other plant growing underneath that particular gametophyte. It is, its entire life is spent there. It gets all of its food, and it's not independent. Here is sphagnum moss. This is the moss which makes up the peat bogs, and again, which is so important in some cultures. Here is the sporophyte now of the fern. These are the sporophylls, or fronds, and on the underside of these fronds, spores are being produced. They will fall to the ground, germinate, and grow into gametophytes. And if we look at the underside of the frond, we'll see these dots. These dots are actually many, many sporangia, as you can see in the more high power slide here. Each of these dots is a sporangium, and inside each sporangium, which is shown in high power here, are the many, many spores, maybe 50 to 100 spores inside each sporangium. If we let the spores germinate, they grow into these gametophytes, these haploid plants, photosynthetic. This has to be produced for the fern to complete its life cycle. And again, to give you an idea of the size, this is a typical test tube, and here are four or five gametophytes, photosynthetic, growing inside the test tube. This slide over here now illustrates the point that in the ferns, although we produce, we have antheridia, and although they're free living, that the only time the male gametes are released is when there's water. So ferns still require some water because their gametes are flagellated. So this is something that they have retained from their algal ancestors and from the bryophytes. They still require water. And if we look carefully at the gametophyte, we will see that in different areas of the gametophyte, we have archegonia and antheridia. And here is an archegonium. And uh, here the gametophyte is below. Here is the egg, and here is the male gamete just prior to fertilization occurring. Once this fertilization occurs, you have a new embryo here. And this next slide shows you the gametophyte, the heart-shaped gametophyte. And growing out of the archegonium, the heart-shaped gametophyte, is the new sporophyte, the new plant. This new plant, then, is the same thing that we have up here in front. We'll go on and make spores again. Now, before we leave this slide, I want to make a point to you. And that point is here, that the gametophyte is getting smaller. And as it gets smaller, there are consequences. And the main consequence is that there is less tissue to make up the archegonium and the antheridium, less tissue to prevent the gametes from drying out. And so the next evolutionary advance which occurs in the plants is the development of more structures to protect the developing gametes. And this next evolutionary advance, which we're going to talk about now, comes from the next group of plants which have evolved from, we believe, a fern ancestor. And so let's talk about that next group of plants which we think has evolved from a fern ancestor. See, that works. Oh, we'll see. I don't know if I can turn the lights on or you. Doesn't seem to want to come on here. There we go. Thank you. OK. About, um, oh, let's see, about uh, 360 million years ago, the next advance to protect the developing gametes occurred, we think evolutionarily speaking. And that next advance was the development of the seed. Next advance to protect the gametes. And this occurred, we think, about 360 million years ago. Dates are not that important. Some of you can memorize them if you would like to. At this time, uh, the first group of seed plants was formed, but it was not until about uh, 280 to 250 million years ago that seed plants became favored in the environment. And that was because the Earth was subjected at that time to extensive periods of glaciation and dryness. And therefore, anything that could protect the gametes would be favored. So about 250 to 280 million years ago, the seed plants began to expand and to take over the surface of the Earth. And at this time, 
one of the first groups of seed plants which developed is a group which you know of as conifers or cone-bearing plants. They are also known as gymnosperms, and we'll go back to this term in a moment. Cone-bearing plants are familiar to you. They are the pine trees, the redwoods, all the plants which make these very large and often showy cones, which generically we call pine cones. Now, in order for you to appreciate what this pine cone is, I want to step back for a moment and just talk about what a tree is. Like the fern, in which the primary generation that we see is the sporophyte, when you look at a conifer or a gymnosperm, the primary generation is also the sporophyte. But like the ferns and the algae and the bryophytes, the gymnosperms show alternation of generation. That is, they have to produce another plant. And the production of this other plant is linked to the formation of the seed. And we'll talk about that in one moment. Now, let's spend a few minutes talking about this cone. I also said that the conifers or cone-bearing plants can be called gymnosperms. This term gymnosperm translates into naked seed. And I'd like you all just to spend a moment and look at me for a second while I do this demonstration. Here is a cone from a gymnosperm. And what I'm going to do is take this, the scales have opened up, take this cone and turn it upside down. If I turn it upside down, the seeds fall out directly. These seeds are naked. They are not surrounded by any other protective structure than the scale on the outside, hence the term gymnosperm. Now, let's talk a little bit more about the cone, and therefore we'll talk about the other generation and where the seed comes from. Where does this cone come from? What is this cone, and how does it figure into the life cycle of the ferns? What I'd like you to do is to imagine, as many biologists now believe, that the first gymnosperms came from or evolved from a now extinct fern ancestor. What I'd like you to do is to take these sporophylls that make up this fern and collapse them down into a cone. And what the cone represents, basically, is a collection of sporophylls. A collection of sporophylls make up this cone. So a cone represents a collection of sporophylls. So if this cone is a collection of sporophylls and is being produced by the 2N, the sporophyte generation, what is associated with the sporophylls? Just like in the ferns, what is associated with this collection of sporophylls is that it makes spores. So on each of these scales or woody structures that you see here, which we're calling a sporophyll, spores are made. That means meiosis occurs. So in the gymnosperms, we produce this large cone. But if you look carefully, and all of you, I guarantee you are familiar with the effects of the next thing I'm going to say, although may not realize it. If you also look carefully at a gymnosperm, you'll find tiny cones. These tiny cones, again, are made up of a collection of sporophylls, and these tiny cones produce something which bothers many of you. These tiny cones produce pollen. So pollen is produced by one cone. We'll write this down for you. And eggs are produced by the other cone. So the large cone 
makes an egg, or the female gamete, And this female gamete is given a special name. It is called a, it comes from, put it this way, it comes from a spore. And we give this spore, to differentiate it from the male, which I'll draw in a moment, we give this spore a special name. We call it a megaspore. And this megaspore is made inside, just like on the ferns, of a sporangium, nothing new, and we call it a megasporangium. How about the male? So in the male over here, we also have a cone. It makes the male gamete, but if we work backwards, the male gamete comes from a male gametophyte, which comes from a spore. And to distinguish the spore from the megaspore, we call it a microspore. The microspore is pollen. That's what pollen is, a microspore. And this is made inside of a micro so here we have a gymnosperm, and on this gymnosperm sporophyte, we could have both cones present, the male cones and the female cones, or they could also be on separate trees. But in any event, the microspores have to get to the female cone in order for fertilization to occur. How does this happen? The trees are growing up in the air. There's no water around to allow the sperm to travel. So in the gymnosperms, we have lost fertile, we've, we've lost uh, uh, flagella. And lost the antheridium. So how do the male gametes get to the female. How does it happen? It happens by the wind. This is pollination. The wind carries the male gametes or the pollen grains to the female cone for fertilization to occur. Now, the wind is a very capricious sort of guy carrying pollen. Maybe it carries it and maybe it doesn't. That means that you have to make a lot of pollen because it only occurs, fertilization only occurs by chance. So you have to make, in wind-pollinated organisms like these gymnosperms, you have to make, it's estimated, a million pollen grains for each successful fertilization. It's a large number that are wasted, but by the large numbers, you ensure some fertilization. Now, let's briefly look at the life cycle of the gymnosperms. And we'll begin by dividing the life cycle based on the cone. And I'd like to start on the right board here with the male cone. And the male cone, just like the female cone, consists of scales, which are sporophylls. Through the process of meiosis, and you're going to see this more in the lab, we make the pollen, which is the microspore. which is N. That pollen is waiting to be shed. It is ready to travel to the female gamete. Now let's look at the female cone. And what I'm going to just do for the female cone is to draw one scale. One scale of the female cone. If we look carefully on this scale, what we would find, first of all, is the mega sporangium we talked about. Inside, we would have the megaspore. And now if we waited for some time on the scale again, 
we would have inside this megasporangium inside the megasporangium we would have the female megagametophyte. And if you're unclear how this happens, just think back to what happens in the ferns. A spore develops into a gametophyte, and in this case we say it develops into a megagametophyte. And this then makes the egg. So we'll put the scale up here again. Here we have the megasporangium. Here we have the mature female gametophyte. And if it's mature, it means it's making the egg. So here it has an archegonium. And here is the egg. So on the scales of this cone, we have the female gamete, which is the egg. And pollen then travels via the wind from the male cones, and fertilization occurs. And you're going to see more about this in the lab. Now, an important point which I want to make for you is that we want to look a little more closely about how the seed develops. And so if we look at what has gone on on the female scale, this is the origin of the seed a really remarkable process which we don't understand. Let's draw that scale again. Here is the megasporangium. Here is the megagametophyte now. Or just think of it as the gametophyte, if you don't want to put the word mega on there. Mega gametophyte. And here is the new embryo, or the new sporophyte. This is with time. Now, where does the seed come from? The seed comes from a totally new structure, which has been elaborated to protect the gamete. And that new structure grows up around the wall of the megasporangium. And that new structure is the seed coat. And so we can define a seed now. And this is important for you to understand where the definition comes from. We can say that a seed, at its grossest level, is a megasporangium surrounded by what will become the seed coat. So if we just reemphasize the changes that have occurred in moving from the ferns to the gymnosperms, the first simple change is that we have lost antheridia. No more flagellated sperm. There are a couple of exceptions, but for our purposes. And uh, the gametophyte is no longer free living. And totally dependent on the mom sporophyte. What have we retained? The most important thing that we have retained, and you should be keeping this straight in your mind, is we've retained alternations of generations life cycle. We have two generations. That's something which goes back to the algae. 
We still retain an archegonium, and we still, of course, have an egg. Okay, have a good time in today's lab, and I'll see you in the afternoons or the mornings when I come to your lab. Good morning. Good morning. Well, that one leaks pretty easy.